It's a very cold morning here in Bering Springs, wherever you might be, the, uh, the bomb cyclone, you might call it. The great blizzard of 2022 is upon us, and we are in the tail end of it here in Bering Springs. So there's not so many people gathered here locally with us, but we trust that those that are watching online, both of our local church family, and those that are part of our family Sabbath by Sabbath that we really rarely get to meet, we're so glad you're here with us. Let's pray as we open our hearts to the Word of God this morning. Lord, we've come into your house seeking a blessing. Many are gathered in their own homes this morning seeking that blessing. And I'm praying, Lord, that it wouldn't pass us by. And I'm asking, Lord, that the king of the ages would be king of our heart. So now, Lord, for the blessings of your presence in our lives, we most humbly entreat that you would come and live in our lives today. And thank you for the other blessings that surround us. On this Christmas Eve, Lord, I pray, may we enthrone you. In Jesus' name I pray again, amen. I entitled my message this morning, Extreme Ownership, Infinite Infant. If you have your Bibles, take if you would turn to John chapter 1. We have different beginnings to the Gospels. Uh, both Matthew and Luke record the story of Jesus' birth with different details. But John, written probably 40 or 50 years later, records a completely different approach to the life of Christ. And in the Gospel of John, he wants to bring together the concept of Christ's humanity and divinity. In John chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God, the Logos. He was in the beginning with God. And then verse 3 captures the magnitude of the gift of heaven. It says, all things came into being through Him. And apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. That light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it. On this Christmas Eve, as we consider the inauspicious beginnings of Jesus, it's important for us to stop and remember that to recognize his deity was to have a heart prepared to recognize our need. When we think about the gospel story, we understand that it begins in the experience of Adam and Eve in the garden. Adam was not beguiled like Eve. He chose to take the fruit. And on the backside of taking the fruit, God comes calling for the two of them who are now afraid. Fear was a new emotion for them, and as the presence of God that had been such comfort and delight to them entered the garden, they found themselves now hiding from the one who had been their great delight. When we look at the storyline, we find that there is a element of divine interaction that cannot be celebrated, at least not in the beginning. The serpent had assured her she would not die, but now they're facing judgment. God has appeared. Adam said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. I'm reading from Genesis 3 and he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? Then the man said, the woman who gave to be with me, she gave me from the tree and I ate. And the Lord said to the woman, what is this that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. And the Lord said to the serpent, because you've done this, cursed are you above all the cattle and more than every beast of the field and on your belly you will go and dust you will eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between her seed and your seed. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. Embedded in this story of divine animosity and enmity is the hope that is imperiled in prophecy and in song and in Holy Scripture. 4,000 years of waiting found the human race looking for a deliverer of a different sort 
than the one who appeared on a quiet night in a little village not far away from Jerusalem. But the arrival of Jesus was not to be met without some measure of fanfare. The angels had announced it to the shepherds and they had borne the message and Zechariah had been encountered by Gabriel, the, the one who had replaced Lucifer, and he had attempted to tell it, though he no longer had a voice. But there were to be a group of people, probably primarily men, who beginning a journey many weeks in advance would find themselves under a deepening conviction as they made their way night after night to the various terrains that would separate them from arriving at the bedside of the baby born in Bethlehem. Matthew chapter 2, verse 1. It says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and we have come to worship him. I want us to recognize for a moment that the beauty of the heavenly gift was veiled in poverty, obscurity, and largely secrecy and silence. This one great hope of all of the ages, the Messiah born not only to the Jews but to the world, arrives in an out-of-the-way place without room in the inn, born among the beast, waiting to be acknowledged for who he really is, and yet hidden in the schemes of his humanity. These men who had studied the stars and the scriptures were impressed that they should make a journey for the reality had come, the hope had arrived. When we consider the journey of their spiritual pilgrimage, were convicted with the sense that somehow they had come to learn to listen to that still small voice. The book of Isaiah tells us you will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. As they prostrated themselves in humility to the God of the universe, as limited as their knowledge was, the light that shone in their hearts brightened and the confidence that prompted them grew. The story of the wise men is the story of all humanity. Anticipating something of significance and surprised at times with its ability to be overlooked. But these men who had the prophecy of Balaam and whatever remnants of holy scripture left behind by Daniel and his friends, these men were waiting for something that would deliver them from the round of hopelessness that had gripped humanity. We know from the scriptures that before the foundation of the world, God had created the, 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 the capsule of hope around which all living beings would find a revelation, a deeper revelation of who God was. Before the foundation of the world, Christ had committed to the protection of freedom of choice at the high cost of the sacrifice of his own life. And these wise men from the east who had watched the round of birth and death and suffering and misery, somewhat from afar, you might say, being ensconced or held up in the upper socioeconomic stratus of their existence in some middle or far eastern kingdom, they had watched and they had seen and they had known that there must be some form of deliverance. The stars in the night sky had displayed the awesomeness of creation and creation's creator. And in the midst of those night moments of gazing, looking for the star, recognizing perhaps some of the time dynamics of the prophecies of Daniel, we don't know for certain. But somehow they sensed the time was near. And when the star appeared in the far sky, they began a pilgrimage. That star led them by night to the city of Jerusalem. When Herod the king 
was encountered by this divine entourage, he was greatly distressed as a very cruel and insecure monarch. And the city was stressed with him. Verse 4, gathering together all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. Prophetically, it was understood that this would be Bethlehem Ephrathah, Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what had been written by the prophet, and you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah who will shepherd my people Israel. Herod secretly called the Magi and determined from them the exact time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child, and when you have found him, report to me, so that I too may come and worship him. And hearing the king, they went on their way, and the star which they had seen in the east reappeared and went on before them until it came and stood over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy, and after coming into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell to the ground and they worshiped him. Opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Somehow the scribes and the Pharisees of Israel were not even pick in their interest enough to pursue a path to Bethlehem to see if anything could be true about this. And yet, these wise men, ignorant and heathen by the standard of the religious leaders of their day, could sense in the midst of the simplicity of this life the infinite infant. Take your Bibles, if you would, and turn over to the book of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. The story of this gem impearled in the ages and yet easily overlooked. Paul, in writing, will remind us in verse 10 that we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he's done, whether good or bad. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest to God and I hope that we are made manifest also in your consciences. There's something about the encounter with the living God that involves a voice that must be recognized in the silence of our own minds. It is this prayer of Paul's that we might be also made manifest in your consciences. I want to talk to you for a few minutes about how the wise man could proceed with confidence and how Paul could hope and pray that the same still small voice speaking through the conscience would awaken many others to make this similar journey. The reality of judgment was one that the wise men recognized in their sphere of experience. They understood the great creation and what little of the oracles of God they had declared. There was an owner of the world, there was a creator of the universe, and that they themselves were created subjects. They made this journey based on the deepening sense of the voice and the conviction that came to them. And Paul appealing to his, his journey with the Corinthians is appealing that this same voice will be made manifest in the hearts and in the consciences of his listeners. On this Christmas Eve, I'm certain that the work of God is going forward with the same kind of compelling confidence to those that may have wandered away from the simplicity of the journey of the Magi. I'm certain on this Christmas Eve that God is speaking and commending himself to the consciences of many who for some reason taking their eyes off Jesus have been discouraged with someone who's taken the name Christian or the church or with themselves as they've wandered into the arms of materialism and meaninglessness. But Paul is appealing to that same still small voice that somehow that voice will be made manifest in the consciences of his listeners. And this morning, I'm speaking on behalf of the living God to remind everyone that this is the infinite infant. This is the one, though veiled in poverty and obscurity and humanity, is still the Lord creator of the universe by which nothing came into existence. Verse 12 of 2 Corinthians 5. 
We're not again commending ourselves to you, but are giving you an occasion to be proud of us that you'll have an answer for those who take pride in appearance and not in heart. This pride of appearance is what the scribes and Pharisees in the nation of Israel were looking for in the coming of Jesus, but did not find, and thus were disappointed and offended. For if we're beside ourselves, it is for God, and if we are of a sound mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ controls us, and having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. Now when Joseph is told the story that this will be the God-man, a baby born like no others, fully God, fully man, this Joseph who doubted the integrity of his betrothed is willing to commit completely to her after an angelic visit and marvel at the concept that God would surrender portions of his omnipresence, portions of his omniscience, portions of his divine identity to become wrapped in the garb of humanity. But it is this very combination of what is divine and human that allows the human experience to enter into the divine payment that would create the redeeming opportunity, the hope, the love, the living opportunity for every human being. For the love of Christ controls us, having concluded that one died for all, therefore all died. It was impossible for an angel without the status of creator to become the redeemer of humanity. The one who was the consummate and complete provider and originator of every human life must be the one that would be the consummate sacrifice on the cross to embrace the penalty of every human disobedience and every human rebellion. We conclude this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And this is the mystery of godliness, that Jesus would go to the cross and take the experience of the second death while experiencing the first death on behalf of every human being. The death that we die is not the death of abandonment and burdenedness with sin. The death that we die is a death that is really asleep. But the death that Jesus died is the accumulated gathering of our condemnation so that we could be redeemed and restored and glorified. Verse 15, he died for all so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but him, for him who died and rose again on their behalf. In Christ is the corporate experience of the entire human race, taking to the cross their guilt, their shame, and their condemnation, bearing in the separation from the Father that which Christ would save every human being from at the end of probation, when the divine city comes down and there is no longer the hope of turning to the heart of grace and compassion. Yes, Jesus Christ carried to the cross in the conglomerate and exhaustive, in, in the, the complete gestalt or whole of humanity, all of the damnation that was associated with the rebellion that begun in heaven was brought to the earth. His death for all, encompassing only as the one who could encompass for them the pain, the separation, the suffering, the penalty, in hopes that they would no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Praise God. Therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh. Even though we've known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him in this way no longer. What is Paul saying? While Jesus became a human being, he was still retaining his godhood. And in the experience of divine creator permission and ability, he takes to the cross and to the grave the penalty of our sin. And the new price that's placed on the human being is the price of the divine nature and person of God. And no one is no longer known in their fleshly value and in their fleshly place in the experience of the universe, but now all have 
placed upon them the imprimatur of the high order of heaven's value as we see the gift of God, God himself, shed to give them new status, new worth, new hope, and no being. Verse 17, because this new reality is ours, because this divine transaction of the infinite infant on a journey to the cross has taken place, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is no longer what he was or she was. He or she is now a new creation. The old things have passed away. The new creation has taken place. The new birth, the new hope, the new ways. Behold, all things have become new. Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself not counting their trespasses against them. And he's committed to us the word of reconciliation. Let's make sure we understand. Because Christ took all of my sin, because Christ bore the penalty of my disobedience and my rebellion and my love of self to the point of participating in the human experience of the crucifixion of Christ, of God, Because Christ has taken all of these things and owned them himself. He who knew no sin becomes sin for us because he takes everything about me that is repulsive and repudiates my place in the heavenly kingdom and legitimates my place as a rebel worthy of death because Jesus owns all of this as my creator as the one who spoke all things into existence because he actually takes what is mine to give me something that is his. He's asking me now to take what is his, which is a burden that other might understand, and be the agent of reconciliation to a lost world. Verse 20, therefore we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were making an appeal through us. And we beg you on behalf of Christ, Be reconciled to God. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Our minds are harking back to the story of the serpents in the wilderness. The transaction was a saving faith. Look at the bronze serpent on the pole and live. Can you imagine the relatives of those bitten by the snakes, divinely held in check throughout the 40 years of wilderness wandering, and now some husband appealing to a wife, some wife appealing to a husband or a child, look and live. God has commended himself to us by becoming that serpent, by becoming the one whose heel is bitten, by experiencing the poison pulsing through the veins, robbing him of his life, taking as it were in his weighted sense the assurance of the Father from him. And now us having received the gift of he who was bitten in the heel as it were with the pain and poison of sin robbing him of the presence of his Father, being made to sin, being made sin so that we might be made the righteousness of Christ. May our consciences be awakened on this Christmas Eve to the infinite infant who would bear in his bosom the one and only ability to carry all of humanity to the cross, bear their penalty to the grave, and break the bonds of the tomb, giving us the absolute assurance not only of a future restoration, but of a present hope and the same resurrection power to break the shackles of sin and save us from our besetting sins. The one who could pray that our consciences would also be brought to life so that our lives could be brought to this newness of life, a new creation in Christ, all things made new. But there is upon us, I believe, an incumbent responsibility. The idea that having had so much of the universe, the the 
the actual impersonating, impersonating an embodiment of God himself, the actual personhood, Jesus, the absolute creator, with no guilt, taking the consummate collection of our human guilt to the cross and into the grave. Once I had the experiment of raising puppies, we had a little Shetland sheepdog, and she was great with uh, puppies. I was there the day they were born on the front room floor while I was living in South Bend in the seminary. I had never seen anything born before, and it was quite an experience for all these little lives to come out to be take, taken and cared for by our family pet. The problem was, was that all of this was new to us, and one of the puppies became ill. And I can remember as my heart was given to care for this mother and her little charges, how we were willing to spend all the money that needed to be spent to take them to the veterinarian for care, and how our hopes of augmenting our meager rations while I was in seminary evaporated because we couldn't bear the thought of seeing any one of them suffer or die and sleeping there on the kitchen floor with that little dog that didn't seem to get better and coming to the place where as we sl slowly sold off these members of our family, which is what it felt like, we eventually came to the one little dog who had cost us nights of sleep and excess monetary outlay and we just couldn't sell that dog some little vestige of what the great investment of heaven was like in the redemption of men, telling us something of experience in regards to the strange act that something that God so tenderly created and so painfully and sacrificially redeemed that somewhere down the road, this judgment by this infinite infant who paid the price would cause God to experience the great grief unknown in its fullness and yet known in measure by human beings who've had to watch and experience the loss of love and life. What does it mean to have extreme ownership? On September 29, 2006, there's a United States Navy SEAL by the name of Michael Mansour. He was on what would have been his last deployment in Ramadi. He was a machine gunner. It wasn't unusual for him to carry 100 pounds of ammunition in 100 degree heat. He was part of the Delta platoon. He was a very young man. And for five months he had served in the reconquering of this insurgent held city called Ramadi. On this final encounter that would enact great heroism, which was nothing unusual for this Michael Mansour, for he'd already received the silver star and the bronze star. He was engaged in a firefight with four insurgents. They withdrew to a rooftop, and there on that rooftop, he and his three fellow seals were engaged in a firefight for their life. Unfortunately, the civilians in the city were on the side of the insurgents and they blocked off the city streets and there was no assistance for these four people on this rooftop. And there, engaged in a very difficult and trying moment, these men were seeking to beat back the attack of the insurgents and take just one more city block. This would be the last encounter for Michael Mansour as he was there on the rooftop in the exposed position, but close to the stairwell from which he could escape should he so choose. As the sound of the bullets, the smell of the gunpowder and the dust in the city streets was all around him, he felt something hit his chest. He turned quickly to see that it was a grenade and the grenade had fallen onto the rooftop where he and his friends were likely 
experience in their last few seconds. He yelled out grenade and then immediately fell down onto the top of it. The explosion would take his life, but not without 30 minutes of extreme suffering. And while he was extracted from the firefight, through I'm sure other great heroic effort, he died so that his friends might live. The other friends on the rooftop were wounded as well, but they did live. He was awarded posthumously the Medal of Honor, which was presented by George W. Bush to his parents on April 8, 2008. He's buried today in Fort Rosecrans National Cemetery. And if you would have been there when his coffin was being moved, you would have seen two rows of Navy SEALs. The President of the United States was there, and as that coffin moved through those two rows, the first SEAL that had passed by reached up and took off their gold trident in Semblia and walked up to the coffin and pinned it to the coffin. Every other Navy SEAL, as the coffin passed by, did the exact same thing. And before the procession was over, what had been a wood coffin was now a gold sealed coffin. Greater love hath no man than this, Jesus said, than to lay down his life for his friends. It's my hope and prayer on this Christmas Eve that the prayer of Paul will be the reality of many who are listening to me I hope that we are made manifest in your consciences. Those men who made the original journey to Jerusalem understood that there is life and there is death. They understood that there is a judgment to come. And they understood that God himself would make himself the sacrifice. On this Christmas Eve, it would behoove us all to take a few moments and look into the night sky and realize that he who spoke them into existence came in obscurity and poverty. He was ignored and rejected. The darkness couldn't perceive the light. This was not a journey that happened in a moment. It was many little decisions over a period of time to where the very image of God would be rejected in place of the idol of their expectations and hopes that somehow served themselves. That infant lying unacknowledged by the masses and certainly the religious and political establishment of the day was the only infinite infant ever to be born. He would be the deliverer, the Lamb of God that would take away the sins of the world. And this morning, God wants us to understand the message of reconciliation that comes to us through his own gift, through the choice to protect our choice to be able to choose, and the devil is working hard to make sure that self-interest will get in the way and blind us to have no desire and no vision to see what's been done for us so that we might be reconciled and a part of the ministry of reconciliation. If you've already made that decision and you're listening to me, you have become the instrument of reconciliation to a lost world who needs to hear the story. Your churches must be refocused around the story being told. Our lives must be refocused around the story being lived and told. That the infinite infant has paid the infinite price that we might be restored to our place in the heavenly family. Wonder, O oh heavens, on this Christmas Eve, might our consciences be awaked, awakened, and might we have a new degree of ownership to the ministry of reconciliation that's been given to us in the reception of Jesus Christ. Our time, our talent, our treasure, our all. May God bless us on this Christmas Eve. May we realize that Christ was born for us 
And may we give our hearts completely to him. May our consciences be awakened and set free by the gift and the divine obligation. Christ the babe was indeed born for you, the infinite infant. May God bless you on this Sabbath Christmas Eve. May we remember that the one who spoke the worlds into existence was laying in that cradle, went all the way to the cross, came out of the grave, as now mediating on our behalf, seeking to vindicate us in the heavenly judgment and hoping that we'll take the message of hope to those who also must someday face that same judgment. Christ the babe, born for me. Christ the babe, born for you. I'm asking on this Christmas Eve that our hearts would be paused long enough to be in touch with the God of the universe who's awakening our conscience and reminding us that no matter where we are and what phase of life, there is an end. But praise God, because of Jesus, there is a new beginning, and that new beginning can be now. We can be new creatures in life. As Jesus paid the price of the second death, we can know the joy of the second life brought to us by this new birth the great suffering and sacrifice of Jesus Christ, unacknowledged and un unlauded by men and yet adored by angels and by so many millions of human beings who've come to recognize the great bankruptcy of their own soul and the great riches of value placed upon them by the actions of heaven and of Christ. Lord, the idea that the one who has bound up the complete infiniteness of the universe would confine himself to the human experience and suffer at the hands of his creatures, his creation and his creatures is beyond our fathoming. But I'm praying, Lord, today, awaken our conscience to the ministry of reconciliation, the great obligation that's upon us to dedicate our life and our talents to letting the rest of the world know a story like no other. So now, Lord, our lives are yours. May we ponder, may we wonder as we wander how Christ the Savior could come and die. Forgive our distraction and our superficiality and now bless us with this divine opportunity of Sabbath rest to reflect and rejoice. And we do this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I want to thank you for joining us online for the few that have gathered here. May we take advantage of this blessed Sabbath where we anticipate a celebration of the incarnation to remember that he who spoke the worlds into existence has spoken new life into our hearts. And if you haven't let him yet, let him. May God bless you. May you have a Merry Christmas. And may you recognize the great value that is now yours. Heaven has placed its complete treasure amidst the human race and hopefully in your heart. God bless you. Have a blessed Sabbath and thank you for joining us for Village at Worship.